All right, welcome to today's webinar, Coral One System, Three Perspectives. Today's presenters are Heather Wilson, who is the Acquisitions and Electronic Resources Librarian at Caltech Library. There, she serves on a team of librarians and developers who manages an evolving local Coral tool. Wilson has also served on the Coral Steering Committee and the Web Committee since 2016. And more recently, she began serving in a new role as the Coral Steering Committee Chair. Exion Song is the Electronic Resources Librarian at North Carolina State University and CSU Libraries. She began leading NCSU's local Coral Working Group on completion of a series of Coral enhancements. She has served on Coral Web Committee and Coral Steering Committees. Um, Carla, Carla Clark holds an MLIS degree from Louisiana State University and has worked as an access services librarian for 17 years before making a career change and joining Circe Dynex as a product manager. Carla is currently focused on their new cloud-based circulation product and mobile staff product. She was involved with the company's decision to adopt Coral as their ERM solution and served as the initial product manager to coordinate with their various departments on implementation and support for their customers who wish to utilize Coral. So welcome to today's presenters and let's get started. Okay, Yan, are you able to advance the slide? Yes. So I'm going to speak for just a moment about Circe Dynix's decision to offer hosting and support services for Coral, the open source ERN. Please advance. So why, you might ask, would a software company choose to leverage an open source application? Uh, we're seeing this a little bit more in the industry these days, particularly with um, vendors like EBSCO who are working on their Folio open source project uh, in the era of the library services platform. Companies are often considering whether it is worthwhile to build something from the ground up or whether to take a look at the open source market and see whether they might be able to leverage some feature or project. So from Circe Dynix's perspective, we have customers asking us to offer an ERM solution. And we knew this was important, um, but we had to consider uh, whether or not we had the available human resources to write something from the ground up. We had to consider the scope and the complexity and priority of such a project. When we think about scope in a software company, we're thinking about things like, is this a, a really big change? Is this something that would affect all of our products? Is it complex? Would it require changes to the underlying architecture of our existing products? Do all of our customers want it? What would be the priority if we chose to build it ourselves? So again, we, we think about those aspects of developing some new set of services. And we think about things like, do we have the resources to build it from the ground up? How long will it take? We think about whether we might buy another company who offers a similar application. That can certainly be a fast solution, but not necessarily an inexpensive one for a company. We might also consider partnering with another vendor, um, or in our case, we concluded that the thing to do was what I like to say, borrow. Utilize an open source application and collaborate with the developer community to do so. Please advance. So we took a look at some of the open source offerings that were available and we concluded that Coral was a very robust product that we could offer to our customers. 
It's based on the best practices defined first by the Digital Library Federation and later refined by NISO. It includes five modules, very common to other ERMs, a resources module for managing those packages and databases, an organization's module to maintain information about your vendors, a licensing module that helps to connect those resources and organizations, helps you understand what the features are that are available, what are your licensing restrictions. It also has a nice usage statistics module. It's got a terrific workflow module uh, or, or a workflows function built into it, I should say, that allows the staff users to carefully track uh, where some resource is in the acquisitions process. It's got uh, license expressions built in and a terms tool so that you can quickly and easily compare across different licenses what you're able to do with the content. Uh, it includes sushi harvesting, pretty important for tracking those statistics. And most importantly, there's a very active, engaged, and organized community of developers led by the Coral Steering Committee. So as a part, as a partner to the open source community, we recognized that we needed to not just take, but to contribute. Um, once we determined that we'd like to use uh, Coral, we took a look at um, what features it offered and made a few enhancements and improvements. We freshened up the CSS a bit. We created an import tool so that it's very easy for you to import your acquisition fund codes and then select them instead of having to manually type them in. Uh, we contributed a few improvements to the resource import and for localization and translation. We created the ability to import Onyx PL licenses and um, to view linked resources from a license record. And one of the biggest features that we have contributed is the ability to connect to an EBSCO knowledge base uh, to import package information and also to update the holdings on the EBSCO knowledge base. So what are we offering to our customers? I want to be very clear that we are not in any way, shape, or form selling open source software. That would be a very serious violation of the license that is applied to Coral. What we are doing is we are offering hosting and support for Coral. So if a customer wishes to utilize Coral as their ERM, we can easily spin up a virtual machine with a copy of Coral already installed. So we maintain any hardware. We take care of the installation process. You don't have to do that. We also handle upgrades, backups, and security, again, all through our SaaS hosting facility. And again, we assist you with your implementation, making some of the basic decisions that are required. Uh, we assist with configuration. We offer training. We can assist with data migration. And we have uh, some documentation and assistance with troubleshooting. So we found this to be a pretty satisfactory arrangement for our customers. And again, just to reiterate, the benefits include Cersei Dynex customers getting a robust ERM that is uh, undergoing ongoing development and enhancement. Our customers don't need to manage hardware or upgrades or Apps. The Coral community gets code contributions and documentation. We have um, contributed back all of the effort that we have made. So regardless of whether you are a Cersei Dynex existing customer or not, you are getting your um, the code contributions that we have made as well. Just a nice um, you know, back and forth sharing agreement. And anyone, Cersei Dynex customers or Coral, developers can contribute to the code and create do-it-yourself enhancements, should they like. 
So we have found that to be a very mutually beneficial partnership with the coral community, and we really appreciate the opportunity to do so. I'll go ahead and pass it on now to Yan to discuss what NCSU has done with coral. All right. Thank you, Color. Hello, um, this is uh, Yan or Xiaoyan Sang. I'm the Electronic Resource Librarian at NC State University Libraries. Um, as a um, academic uh, library, university library, you know, our experience coral is different from uh, social dynamics. So I'm going to share our involvement with coral and how the tool has helped streamline our acquisition workflows at our libraries. All right. A little bit about the University of the Library. Uh, North Carolina State University is a public university with a uh, FTE of around 29,000 of anywhere and undergrad students. The libraries include two main libraries, D.H. Hale, D. H. Hale Junior Library, D.H. Hale Junior Library, and James P. Hunt Junior Library, um, and the three branches, Design Library, Natural Resources, and a Veterinary Medicine Library supporting research and study for the uh, corresponding programs. Uh, library acquisition is a centralized process, including selection, licensing for e-resources, ordering, receiving, and cataloging through the acquisition discovery department. Um, so um, we work uh, the acquisition discovery department, which I mean, you know, we work closely with the selectors from the collection and research strategy department and the branches as well. So the department has three units, monograph unit, serials, and the data project and partnership unit. Serials and monograph units are primarily responsible for continuing, continuing resources and monographic resources, respectively. The picture you're seeing here, this is the Ring Garden Reading Lounge at Hunter Library. So why Coral? Um, the monograph unit is responsible, responsible for acquisition and cataloging for monographic resources, which include books, ebooks, and DVDs. So we use Gobi for ordering ebooks and print books, but there are order requests that could not be handled by Gobi. These are orders that Gobi does not offer or request that, request that need special attention, for example, requiring patron holds or notification and orders as ended electronic copies. So we need a tool to help us manage this order request. Um, this tool would allow unit managers to distribute and attract order requests um, that are sent to staff. Uh, it also allows staff who do the ordering uh, have a quick, easy access to the, um, their assignment. Uh, for selectors, they want to be able to see the status of the order request. So with this needs in mind, we started to look into Coral for solutions in 2013, December. Um, this is a timeline for our Coral involvement. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we began um, our use of Coral in 2013 December started with uh, a couple of simple monograph form order workflows, um, basic order, priority order, and then a year later, um, a little bit over a year later, after we adopted Coral, we realized that the limitation of the tool, which did not allow us to reassign a workflow step or to remove a step. So um, we talked to our IT staff and who have the skills in-house. So working with our IT, we made a couple of uh, enhancements to the workflow functions. Um, like uh, Carla Sustanix, you know, we also contributed the enhancements code back to the code base. With the enhanced workflow functionality, our serious unit started to use Coral for continuing resource new order workflows uh, in 2015, October. Um, and then while we're working on Coral Enhancement, we, um, the libraries announced a good idea grant to encourage innovation in the library. At the time, we knew that uh, we wanted to do more with Coral, for example, managing re renewals. Uh, so we took the opportunity and applied for the grant, and we got the grant. So starting 2016 March, we hired a external development team and completed a series of enhancements. 
This includes um, the, an API form allowing selector enter order request and more workflow editing options, restart the archive workflow, reassign a step with notes, and a few enhancements to the import tool um, build upon search dynasty enhancement um, that Carla just mentioned earlier. So again, you know, we contributed the changes to Coral code base, and they have been added to Coral 2.0, 3.0 uh, release. So the enhancement we completed have enabled more users to use, to use Coral. Oops, back of the slide. Um, by now, you know, we have uh, 48 active users from two departments and three branches within the library. All right, so this is the current acquisition workflow with Coral. You can see it's very streamlined. Um, the process starts with the selectors, initiate the order request, and send it to Coral by, via the API form. The acquisition discovery department unit managers receive emails generated by Coral and distribute, distribute the request to staff. Staff receive email notification from Coral and process the order request. The order request with this workflow includes um, monograph order request for and an electronic copy, orders via non-gobi vendor, and orders requiring paging holes on notification and a continued resource new order um, request. All right, so for the next few slides, I'll quickly go over the process with some uh, screenshots. Um, this is the API form where our selectors would enter the order request information on this form. So it is a long form, so I slice it into three piece, pieces for better view here. Um, it contains the basic metadata information about the order request. On the left side, you'll see title, author, edition, ISBN, or ISSN publisher URL, um, where to URL for um, where to order the resources. In the middle, it's an edition font code used for ordering, patron hold information, and an indicator for urgent order request. On the right hand, it's the three elements that determine which workflow to re trigger so that an email notification can be uh, sent. All right, so the triage workflows. Uh, after order request is submitted to Coral via the API form, the first workflow triggered is the unit manager preparation workflows. Depending on the resource type, monograph, or uh, serial, um, Auto request. The so email notification will go to either monograph or serial unit managers who will review the request and decide on an appropriate workflow and then distribute it to their unit staff. Um, this is uh, showing you, you know, where the unit manager can select a appropriate workflow that apply to the auto request from here. All right, um, this is after the order request assigned to a staff. It's a simple, uh, what you're seeing here is just a simple order work, basic workflow. So staff will follow the step and mark them completed as they go through the steps. You also noted that the previously um, completed workflows uh, is also archived here. As this uh, arrow shows, this is a previous workflow completed. So this allows users to track the history of the work down to the resource. So in Coral, you know, a workflow can be as simple as one step, like showed earlier, or it can be as complex as this one shows here. Um, this is our one-time workflow for ebook package acquisition. It's a process with over ten steps, including. Uh, Encumbered money, licensing, invoicing, setting up access, and documentation. So uh, it shows that Coral has this great uh, flexibility that uh, allows users to customize their workflows enter, and enter as many steps as they want for a workflow. So my queue, this is a place to track uh, order or other workflows. So not all workflow steps can be completed at one time. Uh, we often need to come back later to complete other steps. So that's, um, you know, in my queue, you know, where all the work assignments are kept and staff can come in and see their assignments and finish the work at any time they want. Showing as outstanding task. 
All right, the admin is the most powerful place where you can manage your users and user group, your workflows, um, customize the fields and the data here that you're seeing on the left side showing right here. Uh, it really helps ensure that the tool will meet your exact local specifications. And because of that, it makes the tool easier to be adopted by uh, any users. All right, let's take a look at some data. Since we started our first record in Coral in 2013 December through um, March, end of March uh, 2018. So we have used it for a total of over 5,000 order requests. Um, so among them, 84.8% are print requests, um, and then 11% DVD order requests, um, and 1.8% one-time purchases, and then 2.2% of ebook order requests. So the small percentage of ebook order requests are, is expected because um, the majority of our ebook are purchased through DDA program and approval via Gobi and direct or through direct ebook package purchases with publishers or um, through consortia package purchases. All right, so in addition to the monograph promoter workflows, we have used Coro to manage other workflows. This includes the uh, journal database new direct order from publishers and renewals. We also use Coral for other work distribution, for example, the open access e-resource cataloging work and a ETD cataloging work and some other work distribution as well. Um, so the workflow function in Coral has helped us centralize distribute this uh, difficult work. All right, so just to summarize how we use Coral, it is a workflow tool that helps streamline and improve our library physician workflows among multiple departments. We use it to triage and attract staff work. It is a place where order requests are stored and can be retrieved later. So because of all the uses I mentioned about, it is a great addition to the mainstream library system and has become an important component to our library system suite. So my last slide, I just want to share a few thoughts. Um, during our involvement with Coral, we have played different roles at various stages. We started as a um, uh, regular users with just a few simple workflows, and then to a, a significant contributors um, advancing the tool with a series of comprehensive enhancement. So our experience shows that there are many ways a user, you can get involved with Coral. If you have coding skills, then contribute to code. If you know coding skills, you can help with documentation, um, which also helps uh, relieve the developer's burden. And the web committee is always looking for help from the community. You can also provide a feedback and ideas, which helps make a Coral better. So speaking of again, the participating in the OA project like a Coral, for me, one of the biggest benefits has been growing my knowledge of skills in open source tool development. It's also a great way for professional development, not just for me, but also for our staff as well. So we formed our local Coral team and we learn how to develop something from ideas to collect and refine user requirements and to work with developers to turn these ideas into something that we can really use. So making connections is another gain. This includes both connecting with coworkers who you usually don't have a time interaction, interacting with, and networking with other librarians, developers in the community. So it's a definitely a great rewarding experience. So with that, I'm going to um, pass on to Heather. All right, Heather, you're up. All right, thank you, Yan. That was so interesting. I love hearing about NC State's continuing implementation of Coral. Um, as was previously mentioned by Rachel, I am Heather Wilson. I am the Acquisitions and Electronic Resources Librarian at Caltech Library. I've been here since about September 2015, and I've been a member of the Coral Steering Committee and Web Committee since about 2016. For a while in 2018, I was the Community Outreach Coordinator for Coral, which meant I coordinated a newsletter and some community engagement, and I think I'm still operating in that role a little bit, 
but most recently um, I became the interim Coral Steering Committee Chair. So we have been heavily involved. I am heavily involved and my coworkers at Caltech are also pretty involved with Coral in a number of ways. Um, so I'm here today to talk about kind of how all this happened, how Caltech Library approaches Coral um, and how Caltech, even though it's unique in many ways, can provide some kind of global insights that we've gained from our unique experience for different ways to apply Coral locally. So yeah, starting on the next slide, uh, for this presentation to be useful, it's pretty important to situate Caltech Library within a larger library trend. I think we've all seen at this point. Um, in 2017, Marshall Breeding pointed out the trends toward consolidation or the centralizing of library services in these larger systems, such as Alma. Um, we talked about Folio earlier a little bit. Uh, we see a lot of horizontal consolidating, which means that companies buy other companies with similar services and either leverage the tools those companies provide or collapse them into their, their central system. We also see library system platforms that, um, or library service platforms that link processes together, and we consider those a vertical consolidation. So many different diverse products in a single system to complement each other. Um, it's a fairly unignorable trend that's become a part of a lot of libraries, but as I'll show you on the next slide, Caltech Library hasn't really found that this trend is a good fit for our systems. Um, we are always kind of fighting this, or not really fighting, but just consistently not finding a good way to put it within our work. Um, an examination of those LSPs and other systems and even more systems uh, led us to focus more on connecting more emerging options with our core resources instead, our core data sets, so to speak. We prefer for our systems to remain independent when possible, but we still want them to have options for integrating with each other. So it's a tall demand, but we make it and we stick by it. Um, yeah, can we go to the next slide? So why, like why do this? Um, how did we come to the conclusion that this uh, heavy, heavy standard, this lofty standard um, is fit for us? And there are a number of reasons. Uh, most notably for me is the transparency. When there are a lot of parts behind moving behind scenes, we can't really get in them, and we really like to be the mechanics of our systems. We like being able to fix things on our own and understand why things are happening. If we aren't able to fix them, at least have a sense of the logic involved. Um, and when process are, processes are centralized in a proprietary way, that's harder to do. Plus, we have to rely on often complicated customer service chains. I suspect everyone has um, experienced problems where they needed customer service, where um, they're pretty confident they could have fixed the problem in-house. Um, and yeah, when we do need larger systems, um, yeah, so as a customer service chain, we like to try to bypass that or at least condense it as much as possible, get to the specifics. And so having complementary systems really helps us stay involved in that communication. Um, but sometimes we do need larger systems. And so when we do need those larger systems, we seek emerging providers like Tend, who are uh, the uh, ILS, I guess, developer still, and also a repository maker. Um, yeah, we like to work with newer providers who are able to dedicate more time to hearing our needs. Uh, next slide, please. Um, perhaps uh, the other why that's even more important than the first why to my library is um, most obviously the systems are very expensive. You see all capital line budget here because it is, of course, the all looming issue in our libraries. We, like so many libraries, have these perennial looming budget issues and we have to be attentive to them. But honestly, we aren't even really sure if it would be a good use of the money if the budget were infinite, to be honest. We're seeing um, fewer library searches on the search on the major page, on the home page, more in the, you know, the tools such as Google Scholar, Web of Science, um, or even DOHA, just people going a totally different way. And we also see the increasing cost of paying people to maintain these large things. Uh, we recently heard about LSPs that have, you know, multi-week training programs and um, people are dedicating a lot of staff time and uh, going all in on these, on these and we're not sure that we can do that. And so even after we did dedicate all of that, we continue to see so many problems in the metadata that drives e-resources and serials acquisitions um, that cause so many problems that we don't really see um, how these chain systems are going to get around that yet. And of course, if you we risk getting stuck with something that has a perpetually increasing price that we can't really plan for, these lock-in items that you know we talk about a lot in e-resources. So. 
Another why um, is that it might be overkill, uh, as I indicated in the last slide. Uh, these larger systems are a bit much for my campus. Uh, they're rather bulky, and Caltech is quite small, as you can see here, 3,500 FTE. Our collection is getting smaller um, in terms of our holdings, our, our local holdings all the time. We had a couple of well-documented cancellation rounds, one of which was documenting Kristen Edelman's article cited here. Um, and we're also not really bound to any consortia or group, so we can work very independently. So these larger systems that um, really benefit those consortial or larger group uh, collaborations, we don't really have quite the same level of use for. And we focus more on acquisition rather than acquisition, or I'm sorry, more on access rather than acquisitions at this point. So we really want systems that reflect our leaner approach to collections and focus on access and integration. Yeah, yeah. and so you might know, um, based on this, <laughs> that this is a pretty staff intensive approach. You might say, wow, this is, seems like it takes a lot of staff time. And you are correct. Um, I think we absorb that into the approach and focus on di diversifying skills among the staff. Um, put simply, I think we'd rather pay people and librarians, these people we've required these degrees from and these high level of skills than pay uh, large publishers, large system uh, generators. And so we hire a lot of non-MLS holding professionals with relevant skills to fill librarian positions if it's more appropriate for um, meeting the needs that we can't meet um, or that are met by the larger systems in terms of development, for instance. We also have some ways to keep the work appealing for our librarians. We're pretty, we foster professional engagement and do a lot of satellite work agreements and uh, you know, other unique agreements that recruit and retain valuable staff skills. And we have an ever-changing team environment that allows us to put the best people in the library on a given task without committing to anything long-term. So we'd like to say we are investing in the people, not the products, but also this is affordable and much easier to justify in our budgetary setup. Yeah, so how do we do this? Um, so we've mentioned the staff intensity and um, the number of developers around, um, but one of the major ways is that we have a lot of collaborations between the librarians informing the tools and the developers building those tools. So we don't obsess a lot over the proper role of our staff or the special abilities of a given system. We just start with a problem and use whatever we have, whatever resources we have to fix it. And then from there, we assemble a team and put technology on it to maintain it over time if necessary. So Coral is an ex excellent example of how this approach came to be. Um, we didn't actively seek out Coral itself, but a way to document the changes um, that I explained in the cancellation period. And um, after exploring options and talking with our librarians about what would work for them, we saw that Coral could really meet our campus culture and technological needs. Yeah. And so we often, we often take an open source first approach anyway, seeking collaborative projects that can address the challenges before looking at proprietary software and systems. So we tend to start open source to begin with, but at the same time, we're not seeking to become a developer centric library. So we curate and create open source projects that leverage library and specific knowledge and abilities alongside the coding and programming actions of the project. So in the discussions about whether or not to commit to the Coral project, we made sure that A, the developers saw the potential and the technology, um, B, that our, our resources and system staff were satisfied with how Coral would handle metadata and documentation, and then finally, our public services staff, making sure they could navigate the tool pretty easily to get the information about e-resources that they need. We were in luck that our head of research services had worked with Coral at Texas A&M, and in bringing Coral to the table, we, she already knew that Coral would be helpful to public services and you know, was able to really get a lot of buy-in pretty quickly from her department that way. Um, so even before looking at development and metadata, we knew that public services was really excited about this option. Um, yeah, so we also just give things a shot sometimes. Um, we throw things out there, and Coral was kind of like that, that with the understanding that they were uh, not meeting the needs necessary, then we'll just readdress the pro a whole project. And so we went into Coral with that, but we found pretty quickly that it worked for us. Um, all right, next slide. Thank you. <laughs> Another approach that led us to Coral is that we seek to get highly involved with other projects that have the potential to help libraries beyond Caltech. Um, it sounds like an act of nobility, but it's really, really not. Um, it's really not. We find a lot of personal or library and personal advantage in getting deeply involved with communities like this. We're pretty um, 
we're pretty flexible. We're very agile and flat at Caltech. So we don't have to seek the um, administrative approval for a lot of projects that larger campuses might. At the same time, we have a lot of developers that um, a lot of smaller campuses might not. So we feel a heavy obligation to um, bring that to, you know, to use that in every way to our advantage that we can. So one of the ways is getting deeply involved with open source projects. So larger library open sources projects like CORAL are developed to be as global as possible, which means that we, the active CORAL librarians, can hear a lot about the problems before they become our local problems. Um, and so that's a huge advantage for us. And then we can continue to stay in the conversation from beginning to end. So since there's such an active development developer community in a pretty formal governance system, we jumped on that chance to get more involved with governance. And that's allowed us to influence the system more directly at times, but it also allows, puts us directly in the line of documentation. And now we have all these e-resources experts that we can refer to for all kinds of different issues. So as Yen mentioned, getting involved with CORAL has been massively beneficial to us for these reasons. And we like to think that we're um, you know, providing a lot of output as well. Yeah. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, so now that we've taken, our, taken the Caltech approach to getting CORAL and are getting more involved with the day-to-day -day work of CORAL, we focused on the technology cornerstone of our decentralized system philosophy. So that's the integration piece. Uh, we're big API fans, and we really like to see how we can, can link things together and pass information in a way that's helpful, us, helpful to us. Uh, we did migrate five systems in a year, so that's a lot of the drive for this uh, this interest. Um, we migrate our ILS, Link Resolver, website, you name it. We added seven new tools and systems, like a discovery layer, layer and a bento search. And by 2016, we certainly didn't want to implement any new tools that required a migration, but we also wanted to see um, more data flowing that we were used to seeing. And so, yeah, focusing on integrations and APIs has been really helpful for us. Um, and we've retained that in all of our open source work, but especially CORAL. Tommy Keswick, the developer, developer of our local CORAL team, has really done a lot to aid with the data migration aspects of CORAL. And Laurel Narizny, our systems librarian on the CORAL team, has done so much work to address the metadata matching issues that cause our various silos not to work together. Um, CORAL governance on the whole has actively sought out integrations with a number of knowledge bases. Um, big shout out to Carla Clark on the call for that one, um, plus the COA ILS. Um, and then, as I mentioned, Carla and Cersei Vines facilitated an integration with EBSCO. I didn't mention that part. Um, yeah, and then recently, we, our own team secured a grant from Skelk, um, a local e-resources cons consortium, to develop an integration with GoKB. So this is the future for us in our coral life, is leveraging these integrations, using metadata compiled and cleaned by our own librarians, you know, things informed locally to inform the tools that are globally acting um, through integration. Next slide, please. Oh yeah, so that's great for us, right? You might be saying to your screen, wow, it's extremely specific and one that doesn't seem terribly common. Um, how can this help my library? So that question is especially relevant if you're already committed to an LSP or you're migrating right now, or if you're looking at a folio instance, or if you're receiving orders from on high about integrating um, at the consortial level, um, something that happened in our CSU systems, I think locally is that they kind of had all their stuff centralized in the central system. Um, yeah, and so any type of major migration coming on, you can probably implement a piece of CORAL, uh, similar to how NC State did, to work with you, even if you're not as involved as Caltech is, of course. And so while having these developers in this large project commitment is a major discussion, um, you might find a lean short-term damage control option in CORAL. You can set up the instance just for this metadata migration and cleaning, recording things that might be lost temporarily during a migration. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, Spreadsheet City, that's, a, that's the biggest thing that I really think CORAL can help pretty much all institutions with as we go. Uh, in 2017, Emily, and Singley, Emily Singley and Jane Natchez from Boston College published this really illuminating study that I think I bet a lot of us read um, on these larger centralized systems and the types of e-resources processes that librarians were having to do outside of the system. So they centralize all these systems, but there's still stuff that has to be done. And so they included this graph of these processes that people are finding they have 
do and the percent of those LSP driven libraries that reported doing those processes externally. So this is only the most common. This is a snippet of the graph. It's not the whole thing, um, but it shows that a lot. Um, it shows that a lot of usage-based and license-based and coverage-based tasks are having to be done outside of these LSP systems that centralize all the services, usually in spreadsheets. It seems most people report they're doing these in spreadsheets and they're spread out across the organization. So uh, um, that's really where Coral can intervene and kind of get you out of spreadsheet city back into you know sharing knowledge country. I guess um, getting away from that. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so yeah, why Coral if you don't need Coral? So in light of that knowledge alone, you may find yourself needing a system to handle one of these single processes or documentation processes over time, or you may find yourself just needing to store and document data between other migrations um, longer term just to document what happened. So because the diversity of needs are being met in the Coral project, you could use Coral for just that one process or migration and probably find a Coral library doing the same exact thing you're doing um, in the user list. Some, and some other low commitment uses for Coral, if you have an open source project that you'd like to see formalized under some kind of governance, uh, Coral is a nice reference for that kind of approach. We're pretty long standing. I believe this governance has been in place since 2007, ultimately. Um, and so it's a good example if you need some documentation just to kind of convince your project to get some governance. Um, you might also be able to leverage existing integrations with Coral. So if you just need to mine some data out of the EBSCO knowledge base, for example, and integrate it in another system, Coral is a great way to get at that um, and in a way that doesn't partition all of the data um, the way that a lot of the proprietary systems do. Yeah, so uh, ultimately you might just be interested in open source projects and figuring out what's going on um, when they're co-led by developers, librarians, and developer librarians. Uh, the Coral project has achieved a dynamic that might be interesting just for that reason. So low commitment reasons. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, yeah, nice. Ideally, you've thought of some other reasons why this uh, approach might work for you, um, might be useful. Ideally, you've thought of some other places where Coral might be useful, and I certainly hope so. Um, if you're motivated to invest Coral in the project based on Caltech's approach or Yen's or Carla's, please do reach out. Um, you can email the Coral Steering Committee or communicate with us easily on GitHub. Here's some of that information. And we do have a user group mailing list for working together on the tools. It's not too active. It's active, though. It's not dormant, but it's not too active. Um, you can find that on our website, uh, coral-erm.org. And we also, have a use, we also have a newsletter that we do seasonally, although we may be changing that to more of a blog style. But if you want to contact a direct human being with a specific Coral question or um, any other you know, general e-resources question, of course, please feel free to email me. I am your automatic Coral friend, and it would be great for hear, to hear from you. And thank you for your time. Our